welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your spicy host, Tara Rose, and I'm here every episode to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life that they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social with me. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I would love for you to give me a follow. So when I say diverse dating pools, what I mean is what is it like to be with people who identify outside of the gender binary? Have you thought about what it's like to date someone who's non-binary? What do you need to know about fucking a trans person? As the gender spectrum grows, so do the dating options, and it's a wonderful thing. For this episode, I invite a fellow somatic sex educator, Corey, onto the show to help me discuss this topic. Corey is a non-binary, genderqueer trans person with more than a decade of community facilitation experience. They specialize in sexual health, harm reduction, community organizing, technical knowledge exchange, and radical approaches to wellness. Plus, they have experience dating, playing, and fucking in diverse dating pools. So stay tuned to catch what we have to share. So before I get started with the show, I also want to offer a land acknowledgement. This is the space in which I sit. Let's acknowledge it. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge that I live, work, play, and I'm recording this episode on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina Nation, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. And if you've listened to my first show, then you'll know that I also like to offer a somatic inquiry. So Corey is sitting here with me, and if you'd like to join in on this, Corey, you're more than welcome to. Um, This one I learned from one of our call-ins that we do on Thursday, and it was an offering that I thought was really cool. And it's basically envisioning that you have like a tail. (laughs) So what I'd like to invite those listening and for myself and Corey is just to get your body comfortable Take a few deep breaths. I know that I could use that right now because I feel my heart racing just a little bit. Hmm. And just drop your breath to your pelvis. Breathe into your pelvis. I just like to invite you to bring your attention to your tailbone and just imagine that maybe there's a tail right there sticking out of your tailbone. What does it look like to you? Could be horse tail, little bunny tail. Take a moment to feel what this tail is like with your body. Maybe just give it a little wiggle. How does your tail wag? Mine's happy. (laughs) (sighs) Hmm. I'm just going to shake that out and we can get started. <laughs> Woo. If did, anybody, you want, did you want to hear about my tail? <laughs> I didn't want to hear. If you're willing to share it, I would love to. Um, yeah, it was like, you know how kangaroos tails, like they can fully like lean back on them and yeah. kind of like rocking horse uh, or, you know, um, so it was like big around like as as round as my waist and like kind of throbbing 
uh, but like really muscular and enough that I could like kind of use it as a chair. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but I could see it also like I thought about like, mm, what would that be like when I stand up? And there was a lot of like, boom, boom, like it, <laughs> it could be very destructive. <laughs> like a happy dog when they're near the coffee table. Yeah, or like uh, one of those kinds of dinosaurs that like when they move and their tail just like takes out like huge swaths of forest. Um, yeah, like that. I like it. Sorry. <laughs> it's like the opposite of mine. Mine was like a little bunny tail. <laughs> Cute. Super floofy. <laughs> oh, I'm just like vibrating energy. So I, it just wanted to like shake and quiver. Mm. <laughs> so Corey is there anything that I maybe missed in the intro that you feel like you would like to share with our listeners right now um I mean I'm I'd like to acknowledge that I am calling in from Lekwungen territory uh on what is colonially known as Vancouver Island um and that is where I call home right now um, and my family has been on this island for like three generations. So it's this place that I've called home for a long time, um, but also that I am a settler here and um, and I'm someone who walks through the world with the ability to wear the costume uh, that grants me access that white men get. Um, and sometimes even straight white men, although that feels more precarious. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I think that there's, there's more, obviously we've kind of introduced some of the ideas of tonight's conversation, but I do want to just like preface anything that I say in that regard where like, yeah, I am. I'm someone who has a lot of experience and has put a lot of thought into some of these conversations. And also like, there are definitely ways that I am playing on easy um, in terms of like being someone who has the safety and access in the world as someone who like appears to be able-bodied and appears to be white and appears to be male. Um, and all of those things are like, there's more to them. Um, but my perspectives are limited by that also. Thank you. I really appreciate you bringing that into the space. Because I don't think that that's talked about, especially on podcasts enough from what I've heard. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a thing that, uh, well, I mean, whiteness especially is something that uh, lots of us white folks are really good at, like, just operating as if that's the default. Whereas, like, people who aren't white often will talk about like how that is informing a part of their identity and informing a part of their experience. Uh, and I think that there's an important uh, responsibility of white folks who want to be like dismantling the idea that white is the like the normal default um, and that anything else is the exception that like we do have to talk about, you know, the fact that we're settlers, the fact that like our being here uh, was made possible by genocide and continues to be all the time. Absolutely. And, and yeah, that like the whole idea of, uh, of Canada, it's like, a it's a, a resource extraction project dressed up like a country, um, that a lot of us have normalized and that has totally informed how we interact with the land and how we interact with each other and how we interact with ourselves even. Right. Um, because so much of the, the cultural order that that happens in and that that feeds and that it's, you know, there's a back and forth to that is about this like daddy, God, government, whoever, <laughs> yes. doctor, like some, some dude knows best and is going to make the decisions that work for everybody. Um, and, you know, if you don't fit within the like preset model of how things are, then you're a problem or an exception. And it's really like it, you see that on every level that it's happening everywhere. And so then, like, I think we are hoping in this conversation and in our work a lot to shift towards like, OK, everyone's the best boss of their own self. 
and we're all interconnected and like we're a part of these living systems that like they live and die and we have responsibilities within that and you know to sort of like shift how we relate to everything you know like autonomy and decision making and consent is something that it has these like micro macro uh levels and from like where we how we talk about ourselves to how we treat our partners to like what kind of employment things feel like yes. uh, ethically acceptable options and like everything in between right and yeah often when we start to change on one end of that then like <laughs> things start to change across right and like so oh, true. I didn't realize how much having this like gender awakening was going to change how I feel about my career or whatever right like yes everything unlocks yeah totally I was in oil and gas for 11 years okay and so then, yeah, when yeah, I, I <laughs> then when I started like playing around in non-monogamy I was like every I was like I can't work in this environment anymore like this is so wrong and everything changed it was yeah it was crazy and then I found myself in somatic sex education I was like like total this, awakening <laughs> right this is like a possibly the most polar opposite thing yeah like there's, there is nothing about resource extraction that moves at the speed of trust. It is yeah. like the complete opposite intention, right? Of like, yeah. let's move and take and take over and impose before anyone has a chance to blink, let alone like feel what's real for them. Um, so true. Yeah. So true. Oh my God. Yes. Wow. So many things just came up in that <laughs> like five minutes, but it really does like, play a big part in people's identity and their sexuality and how they and how they present themselves to society even and being white people I feel like we have more privilege in that opportunity too and it's just we're more accepted I want to say just because we're white well yeah there's I think that there's a certain amount of uh like social currency that is granted and that that's the other thing is especially when we're talking about uh like navigating dating pools and stuff like I have only been able to get into some of the venues that maybe we will discuss because like I could walk down the stairs I could get in the building. Yeah. And that is a big problem because a lot of spaces are not built in ways that are uh, that are open to people who have like different mobility requirements. And yeah. um, it, I mean, even yeah, there's there's so many things to that. And I'm sure we could have like heaps and heaps of conversations about neurodiversity and kink and every, you know, like all of every every other little angle within that. But yeah, the fact that I am tall and thin and white and like kind of conventionally attractive in some ways, like uh, has given me a different experience, even as a trans person in sometimes binary like spaces. I know that people who live in larger bodies and darker bodies have not had the same experiences. So I, I definitely like to just sort of like have that on the table first off mm -hmm. um, that like, yeah, there's some things that are beyond my control that have 100% influenced what my perspective is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I can. Yeah. Certainly I'm processing all of that right now. And I'm like, yeah, like clubs that I've been to events that I've been to, most of them aren't accessible. And even for me, like being neurodivergent I'm like sometimes there's a lot of people crammed into one space it's really loud it's hot it's sensory fucking overload for me <laughs> Which... and I feel uncomfortable I'm not going to feel sexy if I'm feeling uncomfortable in my environment no and also I think that I mean that's one of the things that I think is really exciting in a kink potential to be like integrating care needs. And I, I think that this, it's one of the things that I feel like I have learned from uh, from kink spaces and dynamics that I, I bring it into my everyday life. I bring it into my like, you know, vanilla interactions, my parenting, because like the, like the micro macro analogy, like the way that we do these 
conversations, the way that we set things up and like, you know, care is one of the examples. I think it's very important that if we're going to hurt each other on purpose or not, that like we do everything we can to make sure that that's like cool with the people that we're playing with. And yeah. that like, if there's things we can do to make it like more enjoyable or less horrible for the people that we're with, like, why wouldn't we, you know? So where I don't know how we, oh yes. Sensory overload. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like really, really good tops. And like, like I have a new like arrangement in my life that I will like talk about very briefly. It's new and I don't want to like say too much, but um, it's like with another person who, and we have some like similar neurodivergent stuff. And a part of our dynamic is like, I'm responsible to report my self-care and hydration via Google spreadsheet, like once a week. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in turn, like, you know, I get this like encouragement and, um, you know, I'm like told that I'm, I'm doing a really good job and I'm like, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think that there are, there are ways that we can totally use these things, which yeah, can be barriers, can be challenges, can like change what we need and use them as like gifts and like use the, use the structures and the, like the spaces of, you know, liberatory sexuality and the things that we do in, within that. Yeah. To like positive feedback loop. Yeah, <laughs> man, I could definitely use like more of that in my past. Looking back, I'm like, I mean, some... <laughs> I, I would like, I would be so uncomfortable that I would just rely on like drugs and alcohol a lot of times to dissociate from the uncomfortability. And totally. Yeah. That's not healthy. <laughs> no, I have, I had my last drink 18 months ago. Thing for you. Thank you. This month, I think I've had one beer all month, which I'm very proud of myself. Yeah. So usually it's like at least one a day. Or a glass of, well, a glass of wine, a bottle. A bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> so, yeah, I feel a really big shift in my body from that. And also in a big shift in exploring myself through that too. And mm -hmm. kind of what I want sexually and how I want to identify and the people that I want to be around too, you know, and bringing us into like the topic of, dating, playing, fucking in diverse dating pools. It's like, I enjoy being around people who have done the work, not all of the work. I'm not saying they're finished, but done that work of really digging deep and figuring out who they are. And like, to me, that's so ad admirable and, mm -hmm. and strong. Like there's so much strength in that. And I really, I just really admire that in people. And I want to be with people, even if it's like just going on dates to fucking that question everything about society <laughs> and have a desire to be them. And if that means that they are cisgendered in the end, great. Like, I'm super proud of you for actually doing that work and figuring that out too. But I can appreciate like... I can appreciate when people like do that. And, and, and I want to find more people who do yeah. that for themselves. Totally. I, I said, you know, a few years ago in the like, oh, what? Yeah. Who who am I attracted to? Or like, what is my who do I date? Because I've I've done all I have. It's been a long time since I've dated any heterosexual men, but not never. It happened for a second in my teenage years, but I've, you know, I've been with lots of different kinds of trans people and cis people and people who thought they were cis when we started dating. And then it actually just like gender expansiveness. I, I like to joke is like a contagious trait because it's like actually just liberation is contagious. And so like when you yeah. spend time around people who have done whatever their work is to like find their way towards their truth and towards like living in liberated and interconnected ways and like um, then yeah, that it does have this positive feedback loop, right? It's where it's like it does contribute 
to yeah the general like sense of what all is happening and I feel like one of the things that I would also love to talk about tonight is like the way that men fuck each other which I feel really honored as like a trans masculine spectrum person to have had the like windows into that I have because I have you know I have sort of played as like an a bit of an outsider insider in those spaces and in those spaces, there is the like, okay, yes, we're men, asterisks, who are here to fuck each other. But like beyond that, there's not really much conversation. No. <laughs> like <laughs> really at all. Um, and so there's not a lot of like, oh, what do you, what do you do when you're not here? Or like, what do you look like with clothes on or what's your name or like none of that. It just uh, like, that's not a part of what's happening. And so, yeah, I. Hmm. So you're talking about cis, cis men or. Like, obviously not, not exclusively because like I'm, I'm there. So. Okay. Um, (laughs) I just want to. Yeah. But yeah. um, You know, like. I don't have as much experience in like recent days, definitely like since the pandemic with like grinder world, but like I did that for a minute. And like, I will say it is a lot more, it's a lot more like friendly and welcoming for trans people in that sort of like online cruising world than it was 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Like Mm -hmm. it used to be, like I like I would go, I would like go on there when I felt bad about myself and then like <laughs> just feel worse because I was like I am just gonna open this app that is just like a it's like oh would you like some personalized transphobia here you go like oh yuck yeah and it yeah it was it was pretty sad, actually, like the way that a lot of gay men 10 plus years ago were responding to the presence of trans masculine people in their like online spaces. And I mean, also just people are assholes on the internet, right? Like when they feel like they can be and they're like, oh, this isn't a real person. Like people can be pretty harsh. Mm-hmm. But I would say that like, you know, my window sort of up till the pandemic that like, it's a lot chiller these days. Hmm. And I had a lot more experiences in like conventionally cis male spaces where my body was responded to in a like, oh yeah, I've done that before. Or like, oh yeah, no, that's cool. Like that's hot. Like one night I had a dozen guys line up. Like for dates or to meet or no, like I went to the bathhouse. Okay. And I like I had a room at the bathhouse and I just like was in I was I wanted to get plowed and I just like kept bringing them in and I had like I had 12 in a row at least. I lost count, but like I love it. (laughs) Yeah, and I, you know, I wasn't not expecting to be welcomed Hmm. into that space in that way. Uh, but it's changed. It feels more, and maybe that was like a trans night. I don't remember, but Eve, even if it wasn't, I've been to the bathhouse a number of times, including like when I was lactating. Wow. And what, like, what was your experience with that? Was Okay. Okay. I love this story. This is like one of my favorite bathhouse stories. Okay. So... I was doing a workshop for the like trans sex worker drop in that is kind of around the corner from Steamworks um, in the downtown east side. And after the workshop, I was going to be sleeping on my friend's couch and my kid was with her, her grandparents and she was about eight months old. And so like I was still nursing quite a bit mm-hmm. and I was like, OK, I'm going to sleep on my friend's couch. I have to like release some of this pressure. I want to go to Steamworks and like take care of that (laughs) before I go back to my, my friend's apartment who also like is my ex and like my brother, one of my like closest, like chosen family people. And 
we like broke up and fucked again many, many times over, but I don't know that we're really doing that anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I didn't feel like milk was going to be a part of any, so anyway, I was like, I got to take care of this. So I went and do you, are you familiar with like what the bathhouse space is like? Do you want me to like, I've never been to one. We've had okay. people try to get us to go like me and my partner that I live with a few, like a few times. And I was always nervous. I'm like, I don't know what to expect. Like I'll go to a sex club, but <laughs> like, right. why is this so scary to me? I mean, it's something I feel like there, there is also an aspect of the like gender segregation piece where it's like, is this space for me? Am I supposed to be, am I going to be welcome here? And the first, so the first time this is a different story. The first time I went to, to that bathhouse in Vancouver, it was for a focus group research. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the uh, community based research council was like putting okay. on this uh, event during what was at that time the Gay Men's Health Summit. Um, and they were doing this research project about pig sex. And so they were hosting the focus groups at the bathhouse. Wow. So uh, I asked the like, director Jody I was like um just want to confirm like is the bathhouse itself and or this event like trans inclusive I would really like to be a part of this conversation and I feel like I have things to contribute but I'm I don't feel confident like can I need some assurance and he was like oh yes absolutely and I'll like call the place and make sure and so that night we had like six trans guys it was our first time going to the bathhouse all of us mm -hmm. uh and like we ended up having a little focus group together where we like talked about what nasty fucking pigs we were and <laughs> it was great um but also because it was like in that space we kind of had like a host yeah who like toured us around and was yeah. like you know this is you know if you if you come in and you get a room so like the see I'll describe Steamworks because it's my favorite um yeah I'm so, sure the listeners want to hear what a bathhouse right. is like too okay so I this is like one of the things that I have had to grieve the most during the pandemic like this kind of space um I feel like I from when we like first started with social distancing and everything I was like oh my god is this the end of this like is this ever going to come back um, and I still, I still have those tears <laughs> some days where I'm like, <laughs> when, when can this ever come back? But so, right. So Steamworks is like, you enter at the ground level and when you open the door, it's like this big, like huge, heavy door and you open the door and then you get to this like glass window and there's a the person who's working the window and like, you have to pay them for whatever you're going in for. So like, if I mean you don't pay for what you're going in for, you pay for like <laughs> well, <laughs> never mind. Uh, uh, so you know, like if you're if you're frequent, you could there's there's membership options. It's like going yeah. to like a private gym kind of like, thing, right? Like a sex club, like a lifestyle I, swinger club. I suppose so. I yeah. have never I've never been to one. Yeah. So oh. <laughs> so yeah, so you go in and uh, there's like uh, banks of lockers mm -hmm. and the like expectation is that you will like remove street clothes and you get a towel. Some people will like keep on underwear or like wear like leather. Their socks. No, I'm joking. Yeah. No, totally. <laughs> totally. Some people will totally keep their socks and shoes on. But yeah, for the most part, it's like, you know, you have your little white towel and if you're going to wear anything, you're going to wear it and maybe you'll wear it around your waist or maybe you'll wear it around your neck and like you know, wear it over your shoulder. Um, there's a lot of like a lot of dong just like out. And so then like beside the lockers, there's like a little gym. And like, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone actually like working out. <laughs> <It's an iron. laughs> I don't know. Like, I feel like if you're going to the bathhouse to work out, like you're just working out 
to draw attention to yourself to do other things I would think I don't I don't think it would be anyone's like gym of choice anyway maybe maybe I don't know there's like TVs up in the like in the corners and like along the walls that like have gay porn on the porn. all the time <laughs> yeah. uh and the the sort of like soundtrack maybe it's kind of like a sex club yeah. probably yeah um, sounds a little similar mm -hmm. there's some similarities uh and then on the other side of the lockers there is a sauna and a steam room and a wall of showers and a hot tub mm. and the hot tub is like kind of elevated so you like step up to it and then uh and then there's like a bank of toilets and urinals like kind of behind and then in the basement and like this is one of the things where I'm like man if such a place just had a wheel like had an elevator or like even a stair lift like but the basement is like this maze of little halls and like little rooms that are pretty much you know they have a cot and a little bedside table they usually have like a light that is has a couple of settings so you can like have you know it on or whatever mm -hmm. um and then what else is downstairs there's like a, a more toilets there's a glory hole room and like uh, a wall with like mounting points and there's a bed upstairs that is like in a sort of open room but mostly it's like rooms and almost all of the rooms are like just the size of a single cot not much not much more than that so yeah when you go in then you know you could just go in as a guest and have access to the hot tub and the showers and whatever or you could get a room and it's like you know you pay for the night and you know it's usually between like 30 and 50 dollars or something okay. uh and then if you have your door open <laughs> and you're hanging out on the bed um if you're face up then that's like indicating to anyone who walks by that like you're a top and you're waiting and if you are hanging out on the bed and you are face down then that like indicates that you are bottom and you're waiting and so with those pieces and then like you know sometimes people will have the door like open all the way or open part of the way and like with those sort of like simple non-verbal things like we've established the basics right mm -hmm. like we're here to fuck in whatever way the venue is always uh you know i think it there's a, an amount of their responsibility um but also like public health has been a big part of this and like the gay men's health movement and uh, you know just like the influence of the aids crisis like bedside tables come like you know set up with condoms and lube like you know and yeah whether or not people are going to use them it's like there it's included you know and there's like big like dispensers on the wall where you can just like get lots of free condoms anyway shall i continue with the lactation story yes now that we have like the picture Setting. painted yeah. of okay what, what it's like to be here okay right so i came in and i like i started off just like in one of the showers and i was just like trying to squeeze the milk out of my tits, which was like not hard. Like I had a lot of built up. I hadn't seen my kid for maybe like 18 hours or something. I was like, you know, and so I was getting tired. I was like, I'm going in the hot tub and just like massaging my chest and just like milking into the hot tub. And I had a moment where I was like, this is kind of gross. And also, I know without any question that this hot tub is like kept in such a way that it is like it's understood that there are going to be body fluids in this hot tub yeah, and like my breast milk maybe like not even the most like yeah oh I, I yeah know. I yeah know. <laughs> 
so so yeah I was just like you know massaging this milk into the hot tub for a while and then I don't know it seemed like it was a slow night it seemed like nothing was going to happen I had kind of had enough time in the hot tub I went down into the downstairs there's like one other one of the bathrooms that is downstairs they have this like a douching sink awesome yeah so you can like buy a attachment from the front desk yeah that is like your own personal hose end and then you can like hook up and you can clean yourself out there but so it's like this narrow this long narrow black tiled low lit room with like this chrome thing that looks like a water fountain (laughs) in the wall and like a toilet and a sink right And so I'm just like leaning back on the black tile wall behind me and just like squirting milk onto the black tile on the opposite side and just like, just like squirting so much milk. I was like, oh my God, is it ever going to be over? (laughs) And when I finally got to the point where I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to go. I'm going to like go to my friend's house and go sleep on his couch. Like this is whatever it was fine at least I got some time in the hot tub I dealt with the milk thing that's what needed to happen I came out of the bathroom and there was like seven guys that were just like waiting and they were like uh, you know I was like oh were you waiting for like for the room and they're like no we were waiting for you and I I was like oh okay (laughs) uh and they're like do you have a room and I was like no um no and they're like yeah neither do we let's go up to the like bed in the little common area thing and so I like went up with these guys and for I mean what is time really but like there was like one on each of my tits like sucking the milk out and then like spitting in each other's faces And like others were like making out with me and like all over my neck. And then like someone else would be like sucking me off or like fingering me. And it was just like, I was just kind of laying there. And like, there was this, like these men just surrounding me and like taking care of everything that I wanted. And then there was like other, then there was other men like standing in the corner, like jerking off about it. Um, (laughs) This is so erotic. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It was really hot and it was totally not this. It was, it was not something that I expected. You know, I was like, I feel like if anything, the parts of my body that are like female coded or like understood, like not just having tits, but like having lactating tits, like, in the world felt like a very gendered experience. And I didn't know that that would be really like well received Mm -hmm. in a space that is like, so, I don't know, gay male spaces can be misogynist. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, it was a delightful surprise. Yeah, I'd say, (laughs) wow. I've, yeah, I've never been in a bathhouse or like I, I like you know I identify as she they but I sometimes I feel like I'm not supposed to be there either so yeah it's it's uh but that's why we're talking about this right totally I and there are things that I like I don't want to say that like gay male cruising or bathhouses or whatever that they've like got it all right like they don't Mm -hmm. um and I think that that like exclusivity aspect of it is a part of it for sure like there are women in my sex life who I know would have a fucking bomb ass time in a bathhouse and that those fags would also have a bomb ass time with them there but that they wouldn't be given the opportunity yeah, because of how they appear. And, you know, I, I do also understand where like 
we've found ourselves creating these little like spaces and throwing up walls around them of who's included and who's allowed to be there um, because it feels like we need that, you know, yeah. like, because yeah, I, yeah, no, yeah. I get it. And yeah, it's interesting. Like being in a, like in a couple where we do have an open relationship, we don't primarily play alone or date separately, but yeah, like my partner is very into like trans people and but sometimes I'm the barrier in this mm. because they're like, oh, well, you have girlfriend, you're with a girl. Yeah. And it's very interesting because I feel like, yeah, it's just like, hmm. it's it's the opposite of what a lot of the lifestyle community experiences. Mm. Cause you know, in most couples, everybody wants the woman. And so <laughs> everybody wants him. I'm like, huh? Like we've, we've, want more experiences yeah but it's also like challenging I don't know like where to where to start with that mm. we had like one really hot very hot experience in Vegas but yeah <laughs> well sorry what happens in Vegas is supposed to stay in Vegas you know that I mean but I just told the story from the bathhouse and like what happens in the bathhouse is supposed to stay in the bathhouse too so like you know it's <laughs> I Touché. guess we're good. Yeah, I guess we're good. <laughs> but yeah, it's and and it's it is a little bit different. Like there is like the person we met up with, um my partner automatically was like, "Okay, like what pronouns do you like mm -hmm. to use?" And like this is before like I went to school and stuff. So I yeah. didn't even I was like, "Who are you? How do you even know how to ask <laughs> that?" Like like what? And so like there is etiquette too and terminology and I think educating yourself a little bit more about that helps I don't want to say you look more attractive but just being a kinder person oh yeah I was gonna say something about this like two points ago and I lost my train but we'll go <laughs> back to it that who I am attracted to and who is like in my scope is really about uh, intentionality and it's you know the like catty joke way that I will say it is like oh nice gender did your mom pick it up for you <laughs> but like yes <laughs> but really like I don't it's not that I have anything against cis people but like you better be doing it on purpose yeah. because if you haven't even put any thought into it and I mean, honestly, it's just, it's not just about gender, right? It's like about all of these other yeah. things, right? Like if you're just like straight and white and like heterosexual middle class, Monogamist. And you, and, yeah. And you've <laughs> never put any thought into any of that and you're just doing it because it's what you think you're supposed to do. Like, I don't know where we're even going to begin to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, let alone like build or share intimacy, right? Yeah. Like there, there has to have been some process of like your egg has cracked a little bit, right? Like there's got so, the lights got to be letting in somewhere. Um, and, you know, I think maybe this is something you share as a, an educator where it's like, I don't want to be responsible for like cracking someone's egg for them. Right. Mm. Like, I think that there's a, there's some, like, there's some ethical feelings about that also where like, I am aware that being with me and being with the ways that I relate to my sexuality and my gender and my body without even like trying to could like very easily break someone's brain. And like, so I don't like, I don't want to do that if it seems like someone is not actually prepared to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. And I think that's where like podcasts like this or even social media accounts can be actually a really positive thing because that's what gets people starting to think, oh, wait, I don't have, I don't have to accept the gender I was born with. Huh? Yeah. I, yeah, or like I don't oh. have to be in a hetero relationship. Hmm? Huh? Like, yeah. What? Oh, what? What does that mean? <laughs> we 
Okay. So are you open to going through some Instagram questions totally. that yeah, you I said, received? You said that people maybe didn't understand. So let's see. <laughs> let's see what we got. Well, when they read diverse dating pools, I think that they interpreted it as more like non-monogamy. Mm. Okay. Well, I mean, we can talk about that too, because yeah, that's my, that's my jam. Yeah. I, uh, I was in a monogamous relationship once in 2005. Only in one? Mm, yeah. Really? Yeah. I think I yeah. was in probably two or three. But I've been non-monogamous for like nine years. So. Yeah. So you have you'll you'll be able to help with with some of these questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I like this one. How do you do friends with benefits without catching feelings, especially when you're fucking other people? Mm. That's hard for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like I just gotta go back to the bathhouse piece where like if it's just fucking then like keep it as just, just fucking, fucking as possible. Yeah. Because yeah, as soon as you start lingering in the afterglow, then you're going to catch feelings. Yeah. Like getting to know them going for dinner. Yeah. yeah. Same here. Yeah. And you know, I, I had this really interesting conversation with a bunch of people on our way to the gender odyssey conference in Seattle a few years ago. And we were talking about how for a lot of women and people who have existed in the world in a way where they've experienced misogyny, that emotional safety is a prerequisite for sexual intimacy. And for a lot of men, sexual intimacy is a prerequisite for emotional intimacy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm hmm and that, like, that's one of the things about heterosexuals that is the most confusing to me. Um, I'm like, how do you deal with that? <laughs> like, well, how does this work? <laughs> yeah, um, because there is a way that, you know, for me, when I am fucking gay dudes, most of the time, there's the understanding that, like, it's about bodies being bodies and the sex is sex. And when I have had experience with, like, dyke spaces and like lesbian relationships there's a lot more deep les like there's a lot there's a lot more feelings to be caught because like we're gonna get into all of this like emotional intimacy layers yeah that for the most part are things that are skills that are intentionally kept from the development of young boys in our society. Like yeah. most people who have yes. grown up as boys in our society have had barriers, like very specific, like being told, like, don't talk like that. Don't, don't feel cry. like that. Don't share that. Don't like, and so it's not to say that there aren't men who can get there or who've done their work, who, you know, can do that. Um, but like our culture is set up in such a way that like, by and large, most men are just deficient in that regard because that's what they've been set up for. And, you know, trans people, we have this like hybrid experience, right? Which sometimes is the best of both worlds and sometimes is the worst. Yeah, I definitely know what you mean though. <laughs> Guys, first girls, it's just the energy is so different. Every, all the women and women identifying people that I've, been intimate with I've had way deeper relationships with and way crazier breakups yeah well I'm <laughs> I mean I think that more there, emotions <laughs> there exact there's there's just like people who are who are raised as girls in our society are given more skills and more encouragement and more language and more validation in having emotional intelligence and sharing that with other women. Mm -hmm. And that's like a part of how our culture operates. And so are there women who would like to just like join bodies for bodies and fuck because it's fun? Yes, absolutely. But where do you find those women exactly? sometimes more challenging mm -hmm. some I've definitely like 
been with women who feel that but are still challenged by that internalized programming yeah right and like so yeah the how to not catch feels like if you can get yourself to a place where bodies can be bodies and sex can happen as something that's like just a chill and fun thing that people do then sure and also it's possible that you might not be able to Because if sexual intimacy is something that feels like you need to have that like emotional safety to be able to really get there and feel like you can fully be there and be like vulnerable and present in that space, then like, yeah, probably going to catch some feels. (laughs) And it's okay to catch feels too. I mean, maybe having that conversation with a person too. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that is, that's a really powerful thing. It's, it is okay to catch feels and it's something that does require transparency. Yeah. Right. Where, yeah, you can end up in a real messy situation if that is out of balance, right. Where, or if someone is like denying what's real for them. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Hopefully that helps if that person is listening. Okay. Another good question is how do you help support an insecure partner in those settings? So I'm assuming like in the setting of dating, playing with other people. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, insecurity can look so many different ways. Yeah. But I, I will, I'll speak to this from like a anecdote way. So one of my partners grew up in a very closed cultural religious community where like they did not know anyone who wasn't part of their church like until they were 20. Oh my goodness. Okay. Like they went to private schools that was like they were very closed. And so when they started like finding their queerness and coming into their sexuality like it was at odds with like some things that they had internalized for sure and which I had had a little bit of but not as not as isolated and wasn't quite as like strictly conservative I don't think and so I started bringing them to the bathhouse with me And we would have dates uh, at the bathhouse where we would get a room. And then sometimes we would play with the door, like, open just for peeping. And and then sometimes we would, like, play with the door open. But really just, like, the understanding was that, like, we were going to fuck each other. Mm -hmm. and maybe other people would want to play with us or maybe not but it didn't matter because we were gonna go and have a good time anyways and in those experiences like because we were hot for each other and we were having a fun time that was attractive to other people and other people did want to come and play and the way that we were able to involve other people was often I sort of ended up being a, like a hinge point mm-hmm. because I felt more comfortable engaging with a stranger. But then like once I was engaging with the stranger and with them, then we were all playing together and we were having a nice time where like they would not have necessarily felt like they could have initiated that. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I feel like if you have a partner who is like insecure, but interested in those spaces, like if you can go and like, just do the things that you do at home, but like in a way that puts on a show, you know, if that's fun for you, the positive response of other people in the space to like how much erotic charge you bring as a couple. Like, I think that there is a, there's a way that that is a bit of an antidote to that insecurity and like, or it can be. Yeah. No, I like that. And even like, I'm thinking about like orgies that I've been in and 
before I like to have a quick chat with my partner and okay, like, I don't want this to happen to myself. Like if you see this happening, like, can you help me out? Or if I'd like squeeze your arm tight, like it means that I need a break. Like, let's go to the bathroom together and having that. I want to say like container, like that little container built for us Yeah, made me feel more adventurous and more secure in totally. that environment, knowing, Hey, I'm not like thrown out to the wolves alone, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> so I think having like, a, like definitely a mix of that helps too. And yeah, cause he's more adventurous than I would be. And so sometimes he's more of the hinge than me. And, you know, I think that another piece, and I'll like, you know, remember myself back to another partner in another play space where like I had to be okay with leaving the party. Yeah. Because it was not actually working for them. And like, you know, the, the things that we had talked about, the things that we were looking forward to, didn't pan out the way that we had hoped this space like speaking of like sensory stuff it was like the soundtrack of the night was this like really heavy industrial kind of like yeah heavy industrial I don't know what other words to use to describe it but it was like (laughs) "Ah!" and when I had been to that space before it was transcentric Um, dungeon space and it was like the most amazing play space I had ever been in and it had I had been like glorifying it in my memory for years and I had told this partner I was like yeah when we go when we we go to the gender odyssey like we'll go to the center for sex positive education in Seattle and it's you know it's this amazing space and at that time like in between the two years that I had gone, there was five years in between, the Gender Odyssey Conference had taken a turn towards doing more family-oriented stuff. And they had kind of distanced themselves from the sex party that used to be a part of the conference. And there was nobody organizing it anymore. So it was just a regular Saturday night at the club. I guess maybe I have been to a swingers club. Maybe maybe it was... uh, but it was like primarily like heterosexual, middle-aged and older <laughs> white couples with male tops. And it was very yes. hard for my partner who sort of like had a part of her survivor experience was like, what is the difference between what is happening here and what I am observing and witnessing and domestic violence. Like I cannot see the difference because I don't see the things that feel like the important distinguishing factors in kink. Mm -hmm. Like I can't tell that she's enjoying herself. I can't tell that he has the humility to actually be holding this kind of power over her responsibly. And so it's actually just uncomfortable to be in a space where like, you know, that man has been spanking his wife for an hour and a half. And I don't like, yeah, yeah. it's unclear if she's enjoying it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So like in that, in that experience for me to support my partner who was insecure in that space was to hear them and be willing to leave. Yeah. Um, And say like, you know what? Yeah, this is not, what I had wanted to show you this is like it could be different than this like they had never been in any kind of space like that before and I had been so hopeful like the whole drive from the Kootenays to Seattle we had been like taking turns whoever wasn't driving was like reading the topping book out loud like we were just like really gearing ourselves up and then yeah it was disappointing yeah and yeah, sometimes sometimes the thing that your partner needs if they don't feel good in the space is to like not force them to be there. Absolutely. Man, I've seen a lot of that. A lot of people. And then if they are forced to be there, 
then I see a lot of people drinking heavily. Right. right? Which, and so it's like, oh, this is, I see it happening sometimes in these places, these events, these clubs, even like resorts, like hedonism. Yeah. I'm like, do you want to be here? Like, and eventually like there's a big, usually one of them goes off screaming. It, there's a fight. Oh, yeah. I've seen it quite a lot. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think having that conversation before, like what, like, tell me if you need to leave, it's okay to leave. I'm not going to be mad at you. Like affirming that with them because sometimes people are afraid to advocate for themselves themselves especially when they know that their partner's really pumped up to go do something they totally. don't want to let them down but yeah you're letting down yourself yeah well and like I remember one of my first experiences at a big music festival when I was given drugs that I did not consent to taking and my friends were like trying to get me out of this crowd space where I was and where I was like really struggling. And I was like, no, no, no. Like we're just, we're in the perfect part. Like the, we can see this stage so good. And like, we've got, like, we got this place that you wanted to like, I don't want to ruin anyone's time, oh, yeah. you know? And eventually one of my friends was like, I need to go to the bathroom. I don't want to go alone. Will you come with me? I was like, yes, yes, mm -hmm. let's go. Right. And like, sometimes we need to have that out like made very explicit in such a way where like you're not ruining anyone's day yeah. or like if you can't be here or you don't want to like play out the scene that we talked about like that is I'm not gonna like hold that against you you're not like ruining a plan there's no obligation yeah. to follow through even if it was something that was really exciting and I think that's one of the things that can be really intimidating about like sex specific spaces because people can be like oh I bought this ticket I spent $120 yeah, I, on it. Exactly. Like I, you know, I made this investment, I made this commitment. So now like I have to go and I have to have a good time mm -hmm. when like in reality, like if you're not feeling it either, like you, and you don't want to actually go or you don't actually want to be there, like you're not just betraying yourself. You're also like changing the energy of this space. True. Right. Where like, yeah if the intention of the space is that like we're going to gather in a consensual energetic exchange if someone is betraying their own consent then they're they're also like eroding the the ability of the group to be able to do that 100 percent. you know i don't say that in a way that is like you know, victim blamey like i think that it's something that we all have to learn that it's like that we're allowed to say I don't feel like doing this <laughs> and it's yeah. not it's not actually like anyone's fault everyone has to have the ability the equal ability to do that and that's a part of the magic of creating those spaces mm -hmm. right like we are able to do dangerous things when we agree to hold each other safely right like just it, like in school yeah like in the like, intensives yeah yeah. Like, don't gotta, even though like, this is what's on the schedule for today. Like, you don't have to do any of it. Yeah. You don't have to, and you can change your mind. Yeah. And that like, that process of making your choice is actually what is important. It's not like what choice you make is not how that that's not what comes out in the wash. Mm -hmm. Right. Like what comes out at the end is the fact that you made that choice because that's your choice. Yes. Yeah. And, and yeah, that is something that like no one else can do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Corey, thank you so much. <laughs> this has been a really nice time talking with you. I've, I've learned a lot. I've, I don't know how I'm going to go to sleep after this, but I would love for our listeners to know where they can, where they can find you. Do you want to 
give a plug? Do you have something you want to share? Sure, sure. So I write on the internet and I have a website that is my name, K-O-R-I-D-O-T-Y dot com. You can also find me on Facebook. I have a professional educator account that is Corey Doty Educator. And I keep a closed invite only profile on Instagram because I had some troll trouble. Mm. But I mean, that being said, when I learned that I had been named on Fox News as like one of the things that is wrong about the world, I felt like I was doing something right. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm on the right life path. (laughs) Because when like Billy Graham's son is like talking about how, you, you know, you're ruining the world. Like that's a, <laughs> that's a pat on the back, right? Like work, work well done. But as a result, I have to be a little bit tighter about, yeah. about who I let onto Instagram. But you know, like if you have followers that want to follow me, they can find me. It's my name also, I think with a period in between, but you have to request and yeah. And I host a monthly event, which is called the sex toy show and tell and i host it in a digital world that i built on the topia platform which is a fun little world where it's kind of like you have a video game self and then there's also like an interactive video chat aspect oh but i get to program the space so i get to put in all kinds of like links and stuff If you have listeners who are vendors or designers who are in the sex toy industry and they want to connect, they should send me an email, coreydoty at gmail.com, because I can highlight your products. I'm really interested in connecting with vendors and sex toy businesses that have like radical politics in their business practice. Largely the show and tell is not a sales event. It is a peer crowdsourced knowledge and experience sharing space. So we do a different theme each month and invite people to show and tell the things that they like and don't like and Yeah, last month we did one about tools and toys of gender affirmation. That was really awesome. The month before we did one called Off Label, where we focused just on things that are not intended as sex toys. I think we're ready to wrap this up. Thank you, Corey. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah, it was fun. And thank you to all the listeners who tuned in and opened their minds today. Thank you to all of my amazing listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed show. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access information, get social with me. You can follow the show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or my individual Instagram at sexedforthemodernbed. for the Modern Bed.